The government will release the report from its retirement income review today, which could see the government reverse its plan to raise the superannuation rate to 12% over the coming years. Let's go live now to Treasurer Josh Frydenberg. Thanks so much for your time. Before we get to that review, Good Treasurer, morning, Laura. can I ask you first about the ADF report and how you've digested mm. this news that we all read quite sullenly yesterday? Well, no doubt Australians are shocked by those very serious allegations, but the government uh, has established a process uh, with a special investigator uh, that will assess and investigate uh, these particular allegations. But my view, the Prime Minister's view, the Defence Minister's view, and indeed uh, the CDF's view, is that there are so many good people in our Australian Defence Force and they do so much good work, uh, we shouldn't allow uh, these allegations to overshadow um, that broader performance uh, which has been outstanding by so many of our men and women in the ADF. Let me ask you about the income retirement review now. It says that increasing superannuation mm. guarantee will be to the detriment of low income earners. Is that right? Well, it talks about the trade-off between wages and compulsory super. And as you know, uh, we have a superannuation guarantee at 9.5%. Uh, it's scheduled to go up to 10% by mid-next year and to eventually increase by 12%. And so the money that you uh, don't get in your wages today is put into your retirement for later. Um, the report goes into some detail about the adequacy of retirement and what is a good uh, replacement level uh, for your uh, for your retirement based on the income that you had in your working life. It is a very comprehensive report, Laura. It's the first uh, report that looks at our entire retirement income review uh, since compulsory super was established in 1992. So it looks at mm. the so-called three pillars, the age pension, compulsory super, and also voluntary savings, including home ownership. And it confirms that the government is on the right track, uh, trying to uh, enable people uh, to maximise the gains through their super with our significant reforms, which are going to help uh, reduce fees, boost mm -hmm. transparency and boost accountability uh, by the, the various super funds, as well as what we're doing with home ownership, which the report points out is absolutely key to people's financial security and retirement. Well, how do you digest this report then? Will the super guarantee increase of 10% go ahead next year in July's plan? It is legislated, but the government mm. will make a decision uh, before that time. Uh, we're obviously considering this report. Uh, the Governor of the Reserve Bank has had some very uh, strong words on this subject, as well as yeah. other uh, reputable bodies like the Grattan, in, the Grattan Institute. So we'll consider um, these, uh, these findings, the, these, this, these observations by the report. It's more than 600 pages in length. Uh, it was conducted uh, by an independent panel an expert panel led by Mike Callaghan, a former a senior figure at the International Monetary Fund and a former distinguished uh, Treasury official, as well as Professor Ralston, uh, who was the head of the Alliance for a Fairer Retirement, and Caroline Kay, a well-respected uh, business figure who's on the board of the Future Fund. So an expert panel who did an enormous amount of work, and that, uh, and that work is in the report and no doubt will be uh, uh, looked at in great detail by many people in the weeks to come. So you are going to seek to delay it, if I could just clarify that, because what's the point of having a report like this if you don't take its findings seriously? Well, we're obviously uh, looking at its, uh, recommend at its observations uh, very closely. It doesn't make specific recommendations. But as for the increase in super, the government has said uh, that we will make a decision on that uh, before its scheduled increase in mid next year. OK, so are we looking at a scenario whereby that schedule increase to 10 per cent may or may not go ahead? Because, as you say, it's legislated, so you'd need to get the Senate on board. Um, but the trajectory to 12 per cent, is that in the, the medium term, if you like, a, a bigger concern to you? Well, again, the report goes into some detail about that trade-off. Mm. What people lose in wages today, they get in... Uh, in terms of uh, their compulsory super and their retirement incomes yeah. later on. Um, but the, the report looks at what is an adequate amount of money for people to have 
in retirement and it points out that a lot of people don't draw down fully on their super. In fact, they effectively leave a bequest uh, for, for future generations. Um, the superannuation system was designed to be used in retirement and that's mm -hmm. one of the key uh, observations of this report as well as of course uh, they look at the age pension, uh, they talk about it meeting community standards, that it's increased faster than inflation uh, and, uh, and also wages over the last decade. Um, there's a lot in this report that will need to be digested uh, over okay. the weeks to come. Well, it focuses on low-income workers and, and what that might mean. And in a post-COVID mm. uh, recovery, you have spoken about um, how low-income earners often uh, contribute to economic stimulus because they, they spend almost every dollar that they have. Mm. But what guarantee is there? Because I think people watching this today would think, well, superannuation is paid by my employer. It's not paid by me. Um, so what guarantee is there that you would see a wages increase for low-income earners if that guarantee was left at the level it's at? Well, again, that is uh, something that the, the Reserve Bank Governor and the Grattan Institute and this expert body have looked into at great length and they make it very clear that it does uh, come out of people's wages. And, and that is the point. Now, again, these are trade-offs because having a compulsory super system does allow uh, and enable people to save for uh, their retirement. But the question is, at what is the appropriate rate? Now, 9.5% is a very big increase on where it started. Uh, it's going to 12%. I noticed the Labor uh, opposition would like it to even go higher. That does come from people's wages. So it's about getting that balance right, particularly well, it, at these the very be reversed on business economic here? times. Shouldn't it come out of business? Business should be paying for superannuation. And if there is going to be a delay in the increase, the guarantee, what will you do to make sure that we see that in wages growth? Well, you're getting ahead of yourself right now, <laughs> <laughs> Laura, because as, as, as you I and I know, treasurer. this is... <laughs> this is a legislated uh, increase that the government uh, will consider and make a decision yep. on uh, before, um, b before it actually occurs in mid okay. next year. Uh, we are in the middle of a once in a century pandemic. Our economy has had a very big hit. The recovery is now underway. We saw 178,000 jobs created last month. We saw the unemployment rate, uh, the effective unemployment rate come down from 9.3 from down to 7.4%. So we know that consumer confidence, that business confidence uh, is tracking in the right direction. But that being said, uh, we are going to have moderate wage growth uh, for some time. And that's an observation both in the budget as well as uh, by the Reserve Bank. And there is a trade-off here between people's wages today and their superannuation um, uh, incomes that they, that they generate as a result of the, the superannuation guarantee. So these are important mm. observations which will help inform future decision making. Yeah, everything changes uh, post COVID. A lot of things will be turned on, on their head. Just finally, before I let you go, your Liberal Lots colleagues want to consider uh, making childcare tax deductible. Dave Sharma uh, among them. Also, Dominic Perrottet on this program yesterday said it was a good idea. Of course, it doesn't come out of his budget, so uh, I'm sure you'd say he can say that. But is this <laughs> something now that you will consider on a productivity basis? Look, we've put more and more money uh, every year into our childcare system. Uh, and uh, we've also made significant um, reforms to, to that system to enable that those on lower and middle income earners get more of our funding. And that's how it should be, uh, because you actually want to get those people uh, into the workforce if that's a choice that they make. Uh, now, the Labor Party um, has, in effect, uh, provided more money to higher income earners, far What's higher with that? income earners than our system actually provides for. Well, again, it's about getting the balance right. And mm. if they want to be providing a support to people on incomes of half a million dollars, then they need to explain why they are doing that. And uh, that is obviously comes off the broader budget bottom line, which means less money that can be provided to other areas. Uh, and th those are choices okay. that, governments, uh, that governments make. Uh, we have significantly boosted our childcare funding and, uh, and made significant reforms which are delivering better outcomes. And you see that in the workforce participation rate uh, for women that got to a record high uh, before COVID hit.
It won't be the last conversation we have about childcare, Josh Frydenberg, but we have to leave it there. Thanks so much for your time. Good to be with you.